So I'm having a moment right quick at the airport. I'm trying not to. And the lady at the check-in was joking or like laughing at me because my bag is right on 50 pounds. And so I told her I've been traveling. She's like, oh, you know, where have you been? And I said, well, I've circumnavigated the globe. I've been a lot of places. And she said, was that just a, like a goal? And I said, no, you know, I've been shooting a documentary about a health condition I have and I've been interviewing people and doctors that are researching this and I was like I get to go home today and um I don't know when I said that it was just really nice because as great as this trip has been I'm very tired and I really get to go home today <laughs> My name is Brianna, and my life was incredible. There were endless possibilities ahead. I had just finished working for a cruise line, traveling the world and performing for thousands of people. I was in the best shape of my life. I had just passed my ACSM personal trainer certification. And the cherry on top, I had gotten married in September of 2014 surrounded by so many loved ones. I was happy. I was looking forward to the future. But then, that future came crashing down, all because of something that was so preventable. But f- what is eczema? So itself, it's just it's like a skin irritation. Um, so it's not like an infection per se, or no, like no, an no. autoimmune. Uh, I wouldn't call it an infection. An infection is something you catch. You can't really catch eczema. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah so I, it's not like a bacteria. Since a young age, I've always had to deal with eczema. I went to a dermatologist for it, and always had an acute awareness of my skin and its appearance. However, it never stopped me from dancing all throughout my life or being active. It never stopped me from enjoying the water or getting super dirty. I wasn't afraid of being outgoing or goofy or on camera. And generally, most people wouldn't have known I was battling eczema. So as someone so used to dealing with it, I never really knew much about it. But f- what is eczema? So itself. It's a really good question. What is eczema? And I always say that when I give the lecture to the medical students, it's a pretty passionate one hour lecture, lots and lots of slides. And at the end, inevitably, somebody asks that question, what is it again? Like, how do we? It's slippery. It is um, probably not one disease. It's probably a group of diseases that we kind of throw together. But right now, broadly speaking, it is a chronic inflammatory, really itchy condition. It affects kids and adults, although the vast majority of cases are in children. Um, it is related to other allergic diseases like asthma, food allergies, and hay fever. So we know that these are kind of a cluster, but not for everybody. It wasn't until I started working on board a cruise ship that my eczema became such a conundrum. It was all over. It was uncomfortable, and my anxiety skyrocketed trying to deal with such broken out skin. So when I went to see a dermatologist, I was relieved to find she was so sympathetic, having just to look at me and know exactly what I needed, one of which was a prescription for topical steroids. Uh, so a uh, steroid is a wonderful thing. You have to understand that the uh, topical steroids is a standard treatment. Really, it was the advent of corticosteroids steroids that changed everybody's thinking and I think set the tone that we could actually break this inflammation cycle and get people better. They worked great, like a true miracle, but it only lasted for so long. My skin was nowhere near what it used to be. My eczema seemed to get worse and worse, even on the medication. So after getting married, I wanted to get off of all of these drugs the doctor had given me, being on and off of them for almost three years. To my dismay, life took a devastating turn. This condition is easily preventable. 
There is no reason why anyone should ever have to go through this. I had swollen eyes. I had redness that just crept everywhere. I had a problem controlling my body temperature. Any kind of movement was just draining. My blood pressure was low. My heartbeats were really, really fast. I had the insatiable itch that just kept coming. I had ooze pouring out of me and it was so pungent and it stuck to all of my clothes. I had skin that flaked everywhere. I had swollen lymph nodes. And the worst part of it was when my hair started to fall out. And that was the day I decided to do something, to not let this pain go in vain. I took to YouTube, I spoke on national television, I stormed Washington DC, and I crowdfunded enough money by 2017 to take off from my home state of Florida on a solo 56 day trip around the world in order to make my voice count. And if you're in the same position as me or if you're in a different position, that still sucks and you just feel like the world is falling on you. You cannot give up. You cannot. You cannot give up. So what happened to me? What is happening to millions of people who are being led astray by the ones we are supposed to trust the most? And that leads to the second pillar I want to talk about, care networking. We have got to go beyond this paradigm of isolated specialists doing parts care to multidisciplinary teams doing person care. Uncoordinated care today is expensive at best and it is deadly at worst. 80% of medical errors are actually caused by communication and coordination problems amongst medical team members. I had my own heart scare years ago in graduate school and we're under treatment for the kidney and suddenly they're like, oh, we think you have a heart problem. And I have these palpitations that are showing up. They put me through five weeks of tests, very expensive, very scary, before the nurse finally notices the piece of paper, my meds list that I've been carrying to every single appointment and says, oh my gosh, three different specialists had prescribed three different versions of the same drug to me. I did not have a heart problem. I had an overdose problem. I had a care coordination problem. Uh, so it was April 2013, he had it on a regular basis because uh, that's what the dermatologists were prescribing. Um, and then we'd go back and they just um, get uh, the ante, just make put stronger and stronger on. And it started out with a little rash in between his arm and it just spread. When his skin started to get out of hand, we were referred to a pediatric dermatologist. And that's kind of where it all started to go downhill to be honest. Pretty quickly we realized it wasn't enough um, and so I started um, you know going to the doctor regularly and they just kept upping the steroid, the topicals. All over my face every day, multiple times a day for years on end. I can't remember not using steroids. So what are these drugs known as topical steroids and why are they so readily used in today's society? It's been the first line treatment for over 50 years, gaining notable favor and being praised in many dermatology offices for the use of different skin diseases like eczema and psoriasis. In 1979, it was even granted over-the-counter use because it was deemed safe and necessary for patients to have on hand. As stated, the panel concluded on the basis of then-current research that hydrocortisone did not cause hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access suppression, better known as HPA access suppression, three of our body's extremely vital glands that regulate hormone balance. It is now found everywhere, in almost everything, including nasal sprays, itch antidotes, and even vaginal creams. They're being used as a band-aid for anything that's red, anything that's red and itchy, anything that looks like eczema. Everything is called eczema now. Cortisone, or hydrocortisone, is the synthetic version of cortisol, a hormone naturally produced in our body, which is made in our adrenal glands seated right above our kidneys. They were considered a huge breakthrough. So they were initially purified from the adrenal gland of cows. Uh, it was called compound F and they found that this 
basically prednisone or prednisolone uh, cortic corticosteroid was really, really calming down inflammation in the body. And so it transformed everything. This should not be confused with anabolic steroids, commonly used to promote muscle growth. So as something so medically approved and readily available as hydrocortisone, what exactly are the downsides? Hey everyone, um, my name's Laura and I've just hit the 12 week mark um, of going through topical steroid withdrawal. Hello everyone, if you haven't visited my channel before, hello, my name is Cara, I live in the UK and I'm just over 27 months into topical steroid withdrawal. Um, Hi all, um, I'm Nina and I'm just doing a quick um, video because I've seen a lot of um, questions and comments. These three women were my saving grace when I didn't understand what was going wrong with my body. I had taken a Google, as many do, when answers are non-existent, and I was quickly faced with a difficult reality. Nina's YouTube was the first video I ever saw of someone who looked just like me. Hi guys, uh, my name's Nina and I'm from uh, the Itzan Forum, and also I'm on the Facebook page. When Nina mentioned the word Itzan, I'd never heard of that before, so I scrolled down under her video and saw the acronym ITSAN, which stands for the International Topical Steroid Addiction Network, a nonprofit that advocates against the chronic abuse of topical steroids happening all around the world. As I looked at my symptoms while on their site, even checking references like the National Eczema Association to make sure I wasn't being led astray, I was shocked to learn the truth. I have a horrific health condition called red skin syndrome. This is the term most readily used to explain our iatrogenic condition, meaning it is created by the medication itself and can only get better by stopping the drug. And once you've ceased using the medication, you go into TSW, which means topical steroid withdrawal, and can last anywhere between months to years of a patient's life. And thanks to ITSAN, many people are able to find the truth behind their illness. I am really grateful, so, so grateful to ITSAN, and I'm so grateful for finding out about topical steroid withdrawal. And I immediately, you know, Googled that, found ITSAN, and as soon as I read it, as soon as I read the symptoms, I had this moment of clarity that I was like, this is it. ITSAN has been the hub for thousands of people who needed clarity and proof that our condition had a name. So many would be lost on this journey without the research and articles provided by them in order to inform us with what was to pass. But no one, no doctor or medical professional could brace us for the true cost of our condition. They say beginnings are the hardest, and Itzan tells us to seek a supportive doctor. Within the first month of TSW, I knew I had to find a dermatologist. To my surprise, the MD didn't believe in my condition. The notes taken by both the nurse and MD had many errors, including what I had discussed about my history. They made me sound like a crazy person, and in the end, they wished me to use more steroids, including coming back for a potential round of prednisone or a steroid injection. As a result, I was ultimately left without special care because it wasn't justifiable to spend so much money and energy trying to convince a dermatologist of red skin syndrome. We really need the medical community to be behind us because it's not up to healed people to show that this is real. It's up to the medical community and the medical professionals to understand and disseminate this information. You know, it's kind of, they've all got a different answer, but it's like they just brush it off. And it's like, you know, whereas you would think that there would be more kind of um, conscientiousness and care and like, well look, everything else that you're recommending, the soak and seal, the wet wraps, we have tried all the steroid creams, we've gone through the multi-layers, um, he's still bad. So, 
if the therapy is not, if the standard traditional therapy isn't working, and you know, um, without straying into alternative therapies, like what else could it be? Well, it could be the fact that the the therapy that you're giving him has made him a bit worse, and it's exemplified the underlying rash. No, no, that's not possible. No, because I know what I'm doing. Further study is needed to arrive at an accurate definition, diagnostic criteria and prevention and treatment strategies for red skin syndrome, topical steroid addiction, and topical steroid withdrawal. If you feel that you have experienced something like this, I strongly urge you to have that discussion with your provider, present your concerns, go through your treatment regimen again. It needs to be an open discussion with your provider with regard to this. So I just came out of the doctor, um, the past four or five days, I had this like really itchy, I don't know if I call it a rash, it's just a bunch of little bumps all over me and they're under my boob and it's just super itchy, right? So I come in here, I'm thinking maybe it's a fungal infection, handed the nurse an it sandpaper, gives it to him, he comes into the room, hands it right back to me and goes, I don't need this, I know all about RSS. Cool, right? So he takes a look at my skin and goes, oh, that's not fungal. No, 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 I think, I think that's like parasitic. And, and if the cream that I'm gonna give you doesn't work, um, when you come back, you know, we're gonna have to use some steroids. What? I'm asking you to be, I don't know, a good doctor? Just, you know, check and see what could be wrong with my skin? Not, well, I think it's parasitic, but you know, if the cream doesn't work, we'll just put you some steroids, even though I know all about RSS. It's this, literally, talk to him for five minutes. It is this kind of lack of care that drives me insane. When I went to a dermatologist in Finland, I basically got yelled at because I wouldn't take steroids, and I was, they said I was an idiot for doing this. They did not believe in it. We have had loads of bad GP uh, dermatology experiences. There isn't a worse one just because all of them have been bad. Uh, one of the most memorable ones is when I saw a nurse when I first came to London and she gave me all these different steroid creams, one for my neck, one for my eyes, one for my face, one for my armpits, one for my body, one for my groin region, and um, I was told I had to take these all steroid creams for the rest of my life. And they'll be for it. It was disconcerting later, you know, just realizing because, to be honest, several appointments I was really talked down to and condescended and um, to and and then when I would bring up that I was a nurse, oh, 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 well, now now it's totally different. We all walk into our doctor's office planning on having that empowering conversation. But sadly, most of us just get... But there is no such thing as topical steroid withdrawal. The bottom one here. How do you address the fears of use? What do you do when the mother of a, of a child with a, a topic, or an adult, who you know, you're giving them a, a topical steroid and they say to you something like, is this a steroid? The last dermatologist wanted me to put a steroid on. What do you tell them? Well, I use an approach I learned by watching American presidential debates. When I'm asked a question that I don't want to answer, I just answer a different question, okay? I, I don't say it's not a steroid. I never, I just do not use the word steroids in front of patients ever, okay? I tell the patient, she says to me, is, is this a steroid? I tell her, this is an all natural, organic, anti-inflammatory designed to complement your natural healing mechanisms to bring the immune system back into balance and harmony because I like to take a holistic approach to the management of patients with skin disease. Now, I, I live in North Carolina. If the patient moved to North Carolina from California, Seattle, or Portland, you know, they're wearing a tie-dye shirt and Birkenstocks, then it sounds something more like this. This is an all-natural, organic, gluten-free, anti-inflammatory, made in a nut-free facility, designed to complement your natural healing mechanisms to bring the immune system back into balance and harmony, because I like to take a holistic approach 
to the management of patients with skin disease. And if I were practicing in middle America and the patient came off a farm to see me and they're wearing a red hat that says, make America great again, I would throw in there, made in America. Every word of that was totally true. I never said it wasn't a steroid. When this is the conversation that goes on behind our backs, how do we know who is trustworthy and willing to listen? Where can we turn? Talk to them. I found talking with other sufferers to help tremendously, you know, and just to feel that you're not the only one feeling this way. Social media has created a safe environment for millions of us to utilize, connecting us all to one another in support groups and private forums. The knowledge we gain from one another is priceless when so many are wandering lost after being discouraged or rejected in a doctor's office. I know I wouldn't have known what to expect or what kind of symptoms I was going to face while going through TSW if it wasn't for all of these tragic stories being told over the infamous internet. Little day out here in Kelowna at the trestles. I think I can hear something coming through the tunnel. Could be a bear, might be a cougar, or it could be a TSW survivor. <laughs> That's exactly it. Woo! This is Janelle. She grabbed my attention online, being a brave and outspoken advocate, but she absolutely grabbed my heart in person. Hi, my name is Janelle Norman, and I was born in Newfoundland, but I moved to Western Canada when I was nine, and I've spent the rest of my life out here and also spending some time in Mexico. I had used topical steroids uh, when I was younger, briefly, but then when I had moved to British Columbia in my early 20s, uh, I developed that stage allergy. And obviously, moving province to province was when I found that out because there is no stage in the places I previously lived. So that's when my skin started to pick up. They said, hey, you have an allergy to sage? Here's this band-aid to put on. It's called topical steroids. Use it. It's going to fix everything. And once the steroids started, so did the trouble. I remember I knew that there was something really wrong and that it was something to do with the steroids. I was doing some research and I had typed into the computer how can I cure my incurable eczema? And boom, up pops, of course, it's in. And all the symptoms that they had listed uh, describing topical steroid addiction, I was checking off every flag. So it hit me in the face in 2013 that steroids were definitely doing damage to me. Hello, it is day 24 or 25 of my withdrawal. Things got crazy. Um, I... As you can see, I have obviously been through a little bit in the last little while. My condition went from bad eczema to pretty much no face in less than a month. And that was the most excruciating, terrifying time ever. And I was hospitalized for it. And everybody thought I was a burn victim. Nurses were coming up and going, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry this happened to you. What's happened? And I'm like, this is a medication that did this to me. This is not a burn. This is not someone throwing acid on my face. This is my skin peeling itself off my body because it's so destroyed. Although one of the largest signs of RSS is red burning skin, some of the scariest side effects that may manifest are actually dangerous internal imbalances due to the overprescription of steroids. So that's fall, they're both fall. Cause you're not growing, it's a year apart. And it's the same shirt and everything cause he just didn't grow. Yeah. Wow. And then... I was just consistently gaining weight. I was working out all the time. I was trying really hard to lose it and nothing was happening. Cushing syndrome is caused by a buildup of cortisol in your body, which obviously was likely to be the case. It affects not just the fact that you gain weight, but that you can't um, you can't lose it and how you gain it. When I started withdrawal, I lost a hundred pounds in the first year. My eyes, my eyes, all of a sudden were becoming more blurry and more blurry and more sensitive to light. 
Now, if you're using a lot, enough to absorb it, then you can have high blood pressure, you can have sugar problems, you then have cataracts uh, increase in the eye. Of course, you can have the same thing if you put it around the eye, um, glaucoma risk, all these things. And the list goes on and on, including HPA access suppression, which can cause hair loss. As a female, losing your hair through this process is just one more thing that makes you feel that loss of identity. But Janelle taught me something so valuable during my stay, to love yourself, even your flaws. It's more important to me today to be beautiful flawed instead of beautiful because I've got all these little flaws now, but to me, all these little flaws make me into one beautiful thing. It's like, I believe in China, if they have something that breaks, they put it back together with gold. And they keep making, if it breaks again, they keep putting it back together with gold. So they've got all these beautiful little golden cracks and they don't throw it away. They don't consider it ugly because it has a crack. It's beautiful. Life's been heaven since I went through hell. So many things just amaze you again about life. Seeing Janelle thrive and experience life again helped give me such a needed recharge while traveling. Sadly, many others aren't so lucky on their endless road to recovery. Hi guys, it's Nina. I um, am fi about five and a half months into topical steroid withdrawal. I was on topical steroids on and off for 14 years and oral steroids on and off for eight years. I'm hoping this is um, the big hump that I, that I need to get over. I was originally born in Bosnia. I moved here when I was 10, and now I live in Wheaton, Illinois, suburbs of Chicago. At the beginning of my withdrawal, Nina and I would chat all the time and created posters to raise awareness. I looked forward to finally meeting her. However, during my travels, my skin became more and more painful, especially in Chicago while taking in the sights. But having to face Nina's continual suffering really put things into perspective. Literally seeing your skin fall off, not recognizing yourself in the mirror, I had open cracks just on all of my splits on my arms here. Just I was weeping with the ooze that my um, I had to sleep on like six towels so that I could just throw one off in the middle of the night because I couldn't change them myself. I mean, everything was just drenched. The smell was pungent in the entire house. Then the ooze was just constantly coming out from every surface, every orifice, coming out of my ears, coming out of everywhere, sticking to your clothes. It smelled terrible. When you can't move and you can't get dressed and you can't, you, you can't do anything, you know, you, you can't touch anything. You don't want to sit on your furniture. You don't, it, you just feel like this can't possibly be my body. And I, do, I just want out. I just want out of it so badly. To try and function, Try and find a way to cope while your body is decaying before your eyes is such a difficult task. Sleep was pretty much impossible. I stayed up for days on end uh, to the point that I was starting to hallucinate from lack of sleep. The sleep I found was the worst thing. So he just wouldn't sleep. And so then you don't sleep. So now you've both got two people that just haven't slept. And this isn't just like having a bad night. This is, or a bad week even. Um, it's just constantly for months. It's cumulative, right? And so then it's like months upon months. And I'm like, like what I've described to people as psychotically tired, like deliriously tired. And there's no real explaining it to people. For Nina, this journey has been much more than tiring and much longer than anticipated. And, and, and the leg, one leg or whatever, or a part of the body that starts to look a bit better again, you know? And then, bang, the next day, it goes back. Why do some of us suffer for so long? 
When it comes to longevity, there is no pattern or time frame of healing. And with no cure comes the waiting game with only a few comfort measures to assuage some symptoms. Even over three years in, to me, it's mind boggling that this all happens from creams that are sold over the counter too. I don't even have track at all of how much I used from eye drops to creams to eardrops to inhalers. It's just filled my body for 14 years. It is just crazy that they won't even recognize this, even if it's sitting right in front of their face. With such escalating trauma to our body, it's still mind-boggling how most doctors can say that this isn't real. And we are learning because in most of the textbooks are completely silent about the treatment of steroid abuse and uh, how exactly to take the patient out of this, the topical steroid withdrawal or TSW. That's not clearly uh, uh, mentioned in any textbook all over the globe. And that is a gospel truth. This is the gold standard. You follow the steps, it'll be okay. There's nothing. With no textbooks mentioning how to assist a patient through a withdrawal, doctors are still given full reign on how to prescribe topical steroids. Every insert from a tremendous amount of different pharmaceutical companies clearly states that these drugs have a time frame, some even being exclaimed in bold writing. And even with varying side effects being listed on the inserts, there is no mention of these in most doctors' offices, as well as absolutely no mention of Redskin Syndrome or TSW in the literature. The cherry on top? Every guideline gets negated by a few simple words. On large part of body area, steroid application is to be avoided. It's as simple as that. Topical steroids, you know, if you cover a, a large proportion of your body, you know, it's going to act like an oral steroid. And yet, people are consistently being advised to use this drug on multiple areas, the fingertip unit scale being the go-to guide. However, one very important part of the conversation is missing steroid potency. Be sure that you know what potency, how strong it is, the, the different steroids, because the names are confusing. Potency has to do with the strength of the topical steroid being used. These strengths are divided into classes. Class 1, which are steroids like betamethasone or clobetazole. Class 2, mometasone. Class 3, fluticasone. Class 4, triamcinolone and the list goes on all the way to class seven. Classes one and two are known to be the most powerful, while class three and below steadily decrease in strength. Most inserts only give heated warning when using a super potent steroid. However, I was only using a class six steroid, alclometasone. There is always potential for red skin syndrome if abuse or overprescription is occurring. So the skin is sort of the last ditch effort of the body to be able to remove stuff, to get rid of toxins and to excrete when the normal routes of elimination are not working right or are blocked. So in response to that, the functional medicine doctor would start going, hey, why is the skin like that? Where the conventional approach is, well, let's just throw some corticosteroids on top exactly. of it and blow out the immune response, which takes away the lesion or makes things better temporarily. But it's like putting, you know, a new coat of paint over a rusty metal shed without getting rid of the rust and repairing it. When we have raised cortisol and adrenaline, our immune system, which requires a lot of energy, is sort of down-regulated. It's not as sharp. It's, it's not being turned on and regulated as much. And that can affect, particularly with skin things, it can affect sort of make you more prone to infection. Us as eczema, eczema sufferers are, are more prone to certain infections of the skin and if you're using steroids, you can be too. Um, and it affects wound healing. Um, it reduces the collagen in your skin. It can affect the salt balance within your body. It can affect your memory too. If you've ever... In all of this destruction, there seems to be one easy solution. Prevention. The redefined physician is human, knows she's human accepts it, isn't proud of making mistakes, but strives to learn one thing from what happened that she can teach to somebody else. She shares her experience with others, she's supportive when other people talk about their mistakes, and she points out other people's mistakes, not in a gotcha way, 
but in a loving, supportive way so that everybody can benefit. And she works in a culture of medicine that acknowledges that human beings run the system, and when human beings run the system, they will make mistakes from time to time. So the system is evolving to create backups that make it easier to detect those mistakes that humans inevitably make, and also fosters in a loving, supportive way places where everybody who is observing in the healthcare system can actually point out things that could be potential mistakes and is rewarded for doing so, and especially people like me when we do make mistakes, we're rewarded for coming clean. As much potential for a patient to suffer, our system isn't only failing us. Most, most of my colleagues, most doctors that I talk to, we all kind of long for what we would call old-fashioned medicine, where you'd have much more time, where the pressures are a bit lifted, where you could really get to know your patients. If you take insurance, like we do, is you get sort of paid less and less and less every year for the same thing, but just like everybody else, all the overhead keeps going up. You know, everything's more expensive, and you know, the assistants get a raise every year, and the rent often goes up every year, and it's like, oh my gosh, but the input and the output are not balanced, so how do you manage it? So the, often the only thing is to see more and see them faster. The quality of care keeps plummeting. If you have seven minutes to do a new patient for atopic dermatitis, I mean, is it any wonder that they're going to misuse the medicines, that there's going to be misunderstandings, unanswered? How can you do it? Because part of that time is you writing the prescriptions themselves, putting them together. It doesn't make any sense. While in Washington, D.C. in 2016, I had to work with two dermatologists from my district. As frustrated as I was with my voice being muted, I couldn't help but notice just how much pressure doctors are truly under. There's no doubt the bar is set really high now. I think with the advent of YouTube and sort of social media, people really expect to be perfect. It is nearly impossible to prosper under a system so centered around money. It is definitely not a nine to five job. It is. It has to be your hobby too. You have to like. You have to be pretty passionate about. It. So when I talk to you know, people who want to go into medicine, I'm like, you have to really, really, really love it. Even when I'm not seeing patients, I'm thinking about them. I'm reading about them. I'm writing papers. I'm doing stuff. So pretty much devoted to the whole thing. And it's really hard to unplug. Dr. Leo understands the importance of establishing a genuine relationship with his patients. Regrettably. This isn't a common occurrence with dermatologists and steroid withdrawal patients. I think people lose trust in their doctor um, because if you go somewhere, let's say I lost my job. So to keep paying to go to a doctor that keeps telling you you're crazy, like right. I don't believe what you're saying, get out of my office if you're not going to take the prescription for topical steroids. People, but do they say that? I mean, is that oh, their reaction? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. You, really? I've, I mean, I've had doctors get mad at me so many times. I mean, I, I think I might even have in my chart written that I didn't comply with doctor's orders. And this has been the thing that surprised me with all of these specialists I took into. None had, like, any intellectual curiosity. You know, it was just shut it down because I've never heard of it. It's not real. You found something on the Internet. You're scaring yourself. I had a doctor write in her notes that he was so severe due to mother's mismanagement of his eczema. You're really fighting this huge machine of trying to tell them like, you can't keep doing this to people. Like, just giving this person this medication for the rest of their life, you're, you're not helping them. The hot potato of responsibility has been a detrimental issue since the beginning. The phenomenon of red skin syndrome has been deemed rare. And yet, a survey from Japan in 2000 calculated about 12% of patients having steroid addiction. And if that figure is used alongside our number of eczema patients in America, that's almost 3.8 million people, 19 times more than what is considered rare. You need a, a professional like dermatologist or someone of medicine to be able to correctly diagnose it and to understand the pathology of the disease. But what's happening is that's not what's happening. There's misdiagnosis and people don't understand the pathology of topical steroid addiction or red skin syndrome. Exactly where our problem lies. And there's a missing link in the sense that um, if the patient comes back to the doctor and says, look, doc, this is not working or I'm developing a rash as a result of the topical steroids, that doctor has an obligation to report that to the FDA as an adverse drug reaction. That's a missing link. That's not occurring. 
The FDA depends on doctors to gain knowledge about adverse reactions from patients. However, there will never be incidences of RSS being reported because when a patient explains their condition, doctors negate that it's real, which then in turn means nothing gets reported. Thankfully, we can eliminate the middleman and inform the FDA directly. Once on the FDA site, patients are able to easily report a problem by filling out the electronic 3500B form. Likewise, the USA is not the only country that reports these issues. Patients have shown that not only can TSW happen within just a few months of topical steroid use, but that Redskin syndrome can range from full body to certain localized areas. The FDA was also part of a startling memorandum in 2001, which showcased the abuse of 24 different topical steroids in pediatric patients who suffered from a varying range of different side effects. One little boy even died. 18 years later, we are still being treated beyond every recommendation, with no one being held accountable. And to think, on top of steroid abuse, doctors are able to go one step further. My husband's brother, he's about 40, and when he was about five or six, he had a rash. And they went to their local GP, and they had a locum GP, because their one was on holiday, and he was given hydrocortisone. This must have been in 1980, early 80s, I would imagine. And um, and she was quite savvy, my mother in law, and she wasn't she didn't know if she liked it. So she she waited until the her own doctor came back and went back and said, I was given this by the locum, what do you think of this rash? And the doctor, who at the time was close to retirement, so he was established, he took it out of her hand, looked at it and threw it in the bin. And he said, you don't want to put that poison on your child. My name is Gina Dowd and this is, can you say your name? My name is Tessa. We, did, we decided to stop using topical steroids on Brian in October of 2013. And that was after the topical steroids that we were using was just not working anymore. TSW is not only painful for a parent to watch, but can drastically turn into the worst nightmare of their life. We were working so hard and suffering and watching our child suffer and to have the doctors treat us like we were abusing our child. I needed the support during, you know, that's when I needed the support. And it was scary taking him in every time to a doctor who could turn me into CPS for thinking I made the wrong choice and order the treatment that caused his problem thinking, you know, that would help him. So I was just like afraid every time I took him in. We actually have stories of parents that were turned into Child Protective Services because they were not administering topical steroids to their children. And the schools reported those parents and said that they are negligent and abusive because they're not applying topical steroids. The parents tried to provide documentation to the school and the county government agencies and said, look, this is the research. These are our choices as you know parents. We don't want our children to be on topical stories. They've been on them and we choose not to. They were still bullied into you. It becomes such a desperate fight that many end up losing. If you ask me, those clinicians who report people to Child Protective Services and those family members who report their family members to Child Protective Services because that child is not getting topical steroids for their skin condition. If that topical steroid is what's causing this skin condition and you continue to apply it, that's negligent. If you resist treatment, CPS is going to get involved. Oh. And so like, you know, once we figure, like I was saying, that happened a few times. And once we got to the point where I came in knowing about the steroids causing the problem, when they gave me the three options, either immunosuppressants, hospital, or prednisone, I'm like, give me the prednisone, went home and didn't do it, but it wasn't going to win that battle, and I knew it. When a parent whose voice and educational resources are being ignored, while also being in danger of having their child kidnapped from their care, they end up having to go along with the system while secretly not complying with the treatment. This is the same avenue usually taken by adults who need disability. He doesn't prescribe steroids to me. He realized it. I've been going for the two and a half years now. 
But there's one doctor that the derm he's an allergist. I go to the dermatologist, and he's an older man. But he, every time I'm there, he tries to push steroids. Every time, mm -hmm. two and a half years. So Still. I'm like, let him write the prescriptions because also I'm on disability, so I don't want to be defiant. Damn. You know, you can't go. I'm not accepting treatment. And even worse, there are those who are rejected, left to fend for themselves. The majority of us are getting no financial assistance whatsoever. I applied to my Canadian government for help because I had no financial aid. What did they say? No, your condition's not bad enough, so we don't want to help you. This turned out to be very expensive, and I was not counting on that. Uh, I mean, I work in public education, so and she stays at home, so uh, we don't have a large reserve of financial funds. I tried to work. I tried to work through the beginning of it, and um, I only made it about two weeks. And I would be at work and I would pack ice packs into my clothes and I would try to just work like that. And uh... No one should have to live in this type of fear and helplessness while being so ill. I'm angry at the whole system that has allowed for this to happen, um, but then also protects itself. The only reason the white persists is because of the ignorance and the arrogance of the medical profession. And it, it could so easily end and it just doesn't. Most of the time, we are too busy being called steroid phobic, one of the medical community's favorite labels for us. Well, I just think it's silly when we start, you know, attacking people and just boxing them in these like weird categories yeah. that you're phobic just because, you know, you're trying to logically look into something and research something and you've had experiences where I can understand, everybody should understand that you're apprehensive about using these products again. But Dr. Fukaya, a dermatologist in Japan came up with a simple and brilliant idea. He conducted a short experiment using clobetazole twice a day for two weeks on his own arm. The results cannot be denied. I first met Kathy in 2016 while at the American Academy of Dermatology Conference in DC. Right now I'm just waiting for Kathy to get to meet her for the first time. I was extremely impressed with her tenacity as an ITSAM board member to not only play detective for her own child, Rhett, but to help others in their time of desperation. At this point, with so little real information and real research, there's no way around it. It's the only way out is through. And so I think that's why it's so important that we raise awareness about this so that we can stop it before it starts because that's the only answer is, to, is prevention. I just feel like we need this to not be a grassroots effort. We need this to come from the top. We need it to be that people go to their doctor and they're diagnosed with this because to be honest, I don't think it's safe, you know, how it is. You know, it's, it's like a crisis. And thankfully, like many other success stories, Kathy's family has been able to watch their loved one treasure their life once again. Every year at the end of school, we have another big water party and the water balloons and all that. And it just gives me so much joy to see him out there, like fully participating and loving life. I can never, it's like I can never disconnect that. It's always connected to me. The happiness the Telus family has gained from coming out on the other side is something the Bishop family currently dreams of having. Eczema patient filled two jars with dead skin after suffering from a severe reaction when she stopped using topical steroid creams. Wow. I believe it. 
I've seen that um, because her skin was flaking so much, you know, like just like how earlier you're saying that, you know, like Casey would have like all the dead skin cells around her bed. Like she would vacuum her dead skin cells and then when she emptied it, she'll empty it out into these jars. She's probably curious. Yeah. Wow. So Morgan is very complex um, because not only has he got red skin syndrome, but he's got a life-threatening kidney condition called nephrotic syndrome, which involves can involve just being on oral steroids. But because Morgan's got the complex type, he is also on immune suppressant drugs. Morgan, since a very young age, has been pumped full of oral steroids. And when he developed eczema, so came the topicals. So we started off with hydrocortisone, and then I recently looked back and did a chronology, actually, of his medical history, and just saw this pattern to the creams getting stronger and stronger. So we stopped all the topical steroids 18 months ago, but the complex thing with Morgan is... With um, red skin syndrome, the thing that you need to do is get completely away from the topical, from the oral steroids. But for Morgan, sadly, he needs oral steroids to keep him alive for his kidneys. So we're just going round in circles because we can't get away from the steroids. Morgan's life has been extremely difficult. A delicate balance between a drug that is saving his life, but also destroying it. You know, he'd be itching his face, itching his eyes, then he's attacking his arms, then his hands, and literally it spreads. And this, when he was really bad, could go on for the worst time, a couple of hours, couple couldn't of hours, it? Easily. And then stop for maybe an hour and then start again. Um, so just totally debilitating. He was constantly cold and would have a blanket on him. And if you move the blanket, this heat would just come up and it steamed or blasted, didn't it? Yeah. Just, and we were in France for treatment uh, last April and we got him up I, to take him to treatment. And Dano opened the door, the windows of, of his bedroom as I took his top off. And I couldn't see Dana because of the it's reaction like of his heat. It's like steam. Like I'd taken him out of none into but then, he, then he would say he was freezing cold, so he was yeah. burning hot. But yet he literally <coughs> lived with, with his blanket, blanket wrapped around, around him all the time. All I need you to do is just tap it into there for me. That's lovely. And it jumps all the way into my mouth. <laughs> Another hurdle for the Bishop family was the desperate need for a bigger living space. Having just moved from a small flat to a larger end of terrace, it has helped take so much strain off of the family. One of the other things about living in the flat was every single night, Morgan was waking up the neighbors above us and the stress that that would cause on the whole family and the arguments that that would cause for us because we were trying to sort of pacify Morgan and keep him quiet, which was actually winding him up even more. But when you could hear them at four o'clock in the morning, woken up, wandering around, and often their little girl had been woken up as well, it was so stressful. So it's just a bit silly things like that that people would take for granted. And we had uh, dinner last night outside for the first time. You know, Morgan didn't sit outside with us. But he slowly ventured outside and he'd come and stand outside and chat to us with him. Mm. He'd, he'd be funny, he'd do a little, like, little joke and he'd go back in and have a little bit more of his dinner and he'd come back out. We've already seen the positives and the improvement to his lifestyle, um, Jensen's lifestyle as well. <laughs> Any of these improvements would be wondrous for a child. But for Morgan, it means that much more for his wavering mental health. Not just aggressive and angry. He, he said a few weeks back, Mummy, just, um, it's time for me to die now. It's time for me to go to heaven. I'm not calling you Mummy anymore. Please take me to a battleground where they will kill me, they'll shoot me, or throw me out the window and I will die and I'll start again. Thank you for everything you've done for me. I've had a wonderful life, and I was just thinking, you haven't had a wonderful life. And I looked at him and I said, Morgan, I find those things so upsetting that you just said. And he said, well, you know I don't mean it, Mummy, it's just the issues make me say them. To be in such agony 
or even a child feels like their life isn't worth living can make the withdrawal seem like a prison sentence. It was New Year's Eve. My husband, who worked long hours in the prison service, um, had got up very early to, to leave that my children were with a family member because I'd been struggling anyway, so they were overnight. And I was in the bath and I was sobbing because my skin was literally deteriorating in front of my eyes. It was falling apart. And I was in a bad place and he went to work and I was a long time in the bath and I got out and I was in agony and um, yeah, I, I could have potentially done something very silly and it, my parents, my father phoned me and he wasn't at work. He, I broke down, he came straight over, so did my mum. Christian, my husband, felt like something was off and he came home from work early and I literally broke down at that point my mind had gone and I was rocking and I was in the fetal position on this sofa rocking with my head in my dad's lap at the age of 36 and I kept saying to my dad over and over I want to die I want to die she got them and I didn't <laughs> yeah we got skin and I didn't <laughs> <laughs> having a dedicated support system during TSW isn't only appreciated but most often imperative I have been blessed in being surrounded by constant love and care, even if they don't fully understand this painful condition. It's disturbing to hear stories about those who must go it alone due to their friends and family ostracizing them, or even worse, ridiculing them. They need all the help they can get. These people, they, 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 they're desperate for help. Uh, looking at Kelly, I don't know how she could have got through it on her own. There were days when opening my eyes was torment, when getting into the bath was a task, when my body was literally trying to figure itself out. And if I had no one to turn to, my story would have a tragic ending. My mother was like a second mother, so she helped take care of Faith because I could barely even take care of myself. In fact, my mother ended up taking care of both me and Faith, essentially. So it was very difficult to not be mom or wife in my family. I just was surviving day by day. Watching her go through TSW Our family, first of all, I'd have to say is Janelle's very lucky. We're all very lucky that we're very, we're emotional, we're, uh, we're tight-knit, we were there for each other. But we're, it's just the effects of this is far reaching. We're all very affected by it. Obviously, I'm still very emotional about it. They've been amazing. Like, my mom has literally been my hands when I couldn't get dressed, when I had to bathe, when I couldn't eat by myself. Uh, same with my dad. I mean, they spent countless days off of work. Um, afraid to leave me alone because I couldn't even walk at some points. But they've been, and that's one of the things I'm truly blessed about is the fact that oh, they've been such a major support system. There's no way, there's no way I would be here today if my mom and my family didn't keep me above the ground because I was, I was a mess. I was dying inside and out. Looking back at pictures and seeing Janelle and what she went through, it's horrific. Nobody should have to suffer the way Janelle suffered or anybody going through this has had to suffer. There were so many stages and, um, when she started, you know, she was really positive. She had found something that she knew was going, or she hoped was going to make her better. But she learned really quickly that it was going to be hard. And I remember just a few months into it, um, we only lived a few miles apart from each other. And she called me one night, her husband was at work, and she was hysterical. I couldn't even understand what she was saying. 
you know, I, I just kept trying to like ask her like, what is wrong? What can I do? I eventually just hung up the phone and drove over there. And when I got there, I have never in my life seen somebody in so much pain. I mean, she was just writhing in pain, laying on the couch. She could hardly get dressed and she's just hysterically crying and scratching. And there was nothing I could do, not a single thing I could do. I just sat there and that's all she wanted was somebody to be there. You know, you just have to watch it. It was horrible. Steroid withdrawal. Um... It destroys so many parts of you. It destroys your confidence. It destroys your hope. It destroys your career. It destroys your relationships. And um, without my strong, amazing family, I wouldn't be here. I know that. There are endless outcries overwhelming our support groups. Some getting lost as our numbers continue to grow. I just wanted to show everyone that, you know, I do, I do try and live, you know, my life with joy and happiness and I will post things that are trying to be motivating and, you know, like, you can get through things because you can. But it's the quiet moments, particularly in the morning or before bed, or when you know your skin's not feeling great. It's these moments where you just feel really lonely. This is the most impossible condition to explain to people because you see what's going on on the surface but you don't see what's going on underneath the surface I mean knew several times about this thank me for still being here because I think the statistic is 75% of marriages with chronic illness end in divorce because because the caretaker gets tired Looking back on it, I, um, I felt, I feel like I was uh, selfish because she was changing a lot too. The golden rule says, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated. <laughs> you know, um, being in the military, I want my buddies to know that they can count on me and I want to know that I can count on them. And it's no different with my wife. So I started this process as a newlywed. We had been together uh, almost 10 years at the time. Uh, so he watched me go through all of it, all the specialists, all the unanswered questions, everything. And my boyfriend was really supportive in the beginning. We had been together for 11 years, but like many other people uh, going through steroid withdrawal, the effect doesn't just sit on the victims of steroid withdrawal and it's the most difficult thing in the world when all that breaks down. It's one of the hardest things to accept about this condition because it's just so taxing. It takes so much out of you as a person but when you see it start taking away pieces of your life that you worked so hard to get and to build and don't hold on to, it's, you get mad, you get really, really mad. And you think this is, I'm supposed to be getting better. And this is supposed to be better for all of us. I know exactly how they feel watching my own marriage slip away. There are days when you don't know how much more you can take or how much more you can lose. I can remember having that conversation of, hey, 
do you want to be here anymore? And when the answer was no, I wasn't shocked. But I wanted to let him go because I didn't want him to suffer anymore. Relationships take a major beating during withdrawal. It's it's uh it's it's excruciating on the heart. I'm very tired. But I have things to do today. One of them's a fun thing and I don't want to miss out on it. I've been looking forward to it. Being in Japan was the most precarious time while traveling, but also one of the most eye-opening experiences and where our medical system is alarmingly flawed. There is a website run by ProPublica called Dollars for Docs, a place where patients are able to see how much their doctors may be getting paid to prescribe certain drugs. One of those drugs being steroids. You can also view why they are being paid, whether it is for consultation guidance, education, or promotional speaking. It is one thing to pay for a doctor's time, but quite another to see hundreds of thousands of dollars entering a trusted professional's pocket to prescribe one certain drug over the other for financial gain, which does not cease from rising year by year. How could that possibly be ethical? Where is the trust in knowing we are getting the best possible treatment if money is what pushes the pen along? So you in go me tai na koto dewa nai desu kere domo ano kenkyu tiyo wa okane ga kakaremasu. Atarashii kusui no kenkyu wa sareru. Dakedo ano furikaete furui kusui no kutsayo de ano oki no mata ya shoui shite demo. Sore ni tai suru ano kenkyu wo seiyagaisha ga ano ano sponsor ni and that is exactly why we are left with so many unanswered questions. Not because there isn't a way to help, but because we aren't worth the money. When patients are weary and don't know where to turn, they reach out to Dr. Sato, a dermatologist who has a living clinic in Osaka, Japan, where he can monitor TSW patients around the clock. This is the type of treatment we wish to find all over the world because no other doctor fully comprehends the 24 hour symptoms. So when you see that, um, it's a horrific process. I mean, anyone you, you talk to said, you know, it's, it's terrible. You, it's worse than eczema itself. And I know researchers and doctors said, oh, it can't be that bad. But they don't live with eczema patients or people who are going through topical sterile withdrawal. They don't live every single day, every hour with them and see the process. But with Dr. Sato, he is able to study and look out for the patient's every need. When they stop moisturizer, uh, they often get uh, infection, bacteria, viral. If the um, doctor knows that, they will find very early stages 
and one serious infection is known as eczema herpeticum, which can spread rapidly without antiviral treatment. Because without the swift use of antivirals, this eruption can affect multiple organs and cause eye damage. Dr. Sato's clinic is revolutionary, run with the basic principle of compassion in mind. But what if your patients should never have needed your help? What if your patients weren't sick in the first place? One major issue in India is the need to be fair, because fairness equates to beauty, a tone many try and become by using steroids purchased without a prescription. In most of the cases, they, when they start applying, they don't have anything wrong with them. They just want it to be fair. The steroid damages the skin, because there's no reason to apply. The fairness issue over here in India is insane. Every single thing in the newspaper that I've been looking at is just a bunch of light-skinned girls and men. And it's incredible to see just how many lightning ads are out when you're driving. And most of them contain steroids because steroids can give you that hypopigmentation that can lighten your skin. Fairness, however, isn't the only issue dermatologists face. The Indian market has been swamped with dangerous steroid compounds. So this is a huge, huge problem we are facing. And uh, in India, unfortunately, anything and everything is available over the counter. And you don't need a doctor's prescription for that. And the topical antifungals, very rarely these are used alone. In most of the cases, they are being supplied by the pharmaceutical companies in combination as a cocktail with antifungal, antibiotic, and a potent steroid. Using a topical steroid on top of a fungal infection can cause even more damage than the original problem. Am I using it for proper indication? Suppose it is a fungal infection and I have started using steroid without starting any antifungal orally. That is not the correct thing. So the fungus is getting bigger and bigger. Very happy with the steroid because the fungus loves steroid. It's a huge amount of market that is uh, the industry is surviving on this unauthorized, unethical, unscientific sale of steroid products because they thrive on completely non-prescription support of steroid. And when we did a big study and there it was shown that 90% of the abuse steroid are super potent and 60% are using without any prescription and without any reason. And as distressing as it sounds, people from all around the world will seemingly do anything to have that perfect appearance. You know, people think skin condition. Oh, that could just be cleared up with some cream. Like that it's not a big deal. But then there's also a functional and practical piece. If you've never seen bad eczema, you might not know this, but if your hands are raw, cracked, and bleeding, how can you interact? How can you work with computers or paper or shake someone's hand? You simply can't. And so we really get this the worst of both worlds in that. We get marginalized as being nothing, and then the problems are actually magnified because not only are they significant problems, but they're also on the organ that really is the largest in, in interfacing with the world. No matter how smart or strong or good you are, it takes time for other people to find it out. In the meantime, all that those around you have to judge you by is what they can see and hear and smell. And sitting there in public transportation, feeling like everybody's eyes are on me. Yeah. And I would like look up and then everyone would just like quickly yeah. just look down. There was quite a few times where I would be in public and I, for the, when my hands were really bad, I always would have them bandaged up or have gloves with the fingertips cut out. For the most part, now sometimes your hands obviously needed air, you couldn't have them covered all the time. So when they would be exposed, a lot of times I would get the question, what's wrong with your hands? Are you okay? Is that a burn? Uh, and that makes you feel terrible. You don't feel good about yourself if somebody's asking you, you know, something you're really self-conscious about that's over your entire body. When steroids seem to be the only answer in a doctor's office, 
yet are creating such catastrophic consequences? Have there been any new advances driving us away from the overprescription epidemic? Let's see. Yeah, we I'll tell. I'll tell her. Does it burn? Yes, so dupilumab is a systemic therapy. It's a shot you give yourself uh, every two weeks. And what's interesting, this one is a human antibody. So it's a protein antibody uh, that binds to this IL-4 receptor. When it binds to that, it actually blocks the signaling for two interleukins, two cytokines or cell messengers, IL-4 and IL-13. And it's exciting because those are really important for triggering the inflammation and fueling the inflammation of atopic dermatitis. But what's really fascinating is those not only trigger the inflammation, they actually play a role in damaging the skin barrier. In the presence of IL-4 and IL-13, you stop making filaggrin like you're supposed to. So you kind of become deficient in this structural protein to keep your skin from becoming leaky. So it's really neat. We can block these two with this medicine and probably help the inflammation directly, but also probably indirectly at least help keep the skin barrier strong. I'm absolutely in love with uh, dupilumab. Um, it's changed my life, like literally. Um, the change was so quick that it's almost like, how, how can I react to it besides um, be in complete gratitude. This is a pretty this is a pretty big deal for us for again for our moderate or severe patients. For people with milder disease, you don't want to give them a shot. It still potentially has some side effects, so we really have to be careful. That being said, it does seem much safer than other medicines that we frequently use, like our systemic immunosuppressants, cyclosporin, azathioprine, methotrexate, those have a bunch of side effects that are really important. More importantly still though, those are not approved by the FDA for atopic dermatitis. I think if one does not have a love-hate relationship with immunosuppressants, they're not taking that drug seriously. They need someone who's gonna really be on top of that. So I was on immunosuppressants starting at month 13. I got to the point that I was flaring so badly that I was desperate for relief. And most commonly used is cyclosporin. So cyclosporin's been used for a long time. Its main indication is for organ transplant recipients. Very good medicine, but it's damaging to the kidneys. Even in the shorter term, it's not great for your kidneys. Long term, it's quite damaging. It increases your risk of cancers too, because part of the role of the immune system is surveillance for skin cancer and other cancers. And if you keep it quiet, these things can brew. So again, we have to be really cautious. Maybe the next most common one is methotrexate. Methotrexate has a long history. It's used a lot in arthritis. It's used a lot in psoriasis, particularly before the biologics came out for psoriasis. It's a very good medicine overall. It's pretty safe. Its big side effect is the liver. These drugs cannot be taken lightly and do showcase those unwanted side effects. So I was actually on cyclosporin for about six months the summer prior. It worked pretty well. It stopped working after a while. And then in the fall, I transitioned to methotrexate. That one, you have to steadily increase your dose to reach the max dose. So by December, when I did get that blood infection, I was on the max dose of methotrexate and it, it, it wasn't working at that time. Um, so I was about three months in on the methotrexate on the max dose for any disease that they, they use it for which is why new drugs like dupilumab, created specifically for severe eczema patients, are important improvements in treatment. However, if we move away from systemic drugs, there have been two other topicals developed for eczema patients. So in the, in the 80s, um, Dr. John Hannafin, who's one of the kind of the, the, the greats who really was one of the founding fathers of the atopic dermatitis movement, created the idea that, or came up with the idea that phosphodiesterase enzyme could be involved in the, in the inflammation pathway for atopic dermatitis. It's taken all these years, decades later, to come up with a topical medicine that actually blocks this phosphodiesterase, um, specifically phosphodiesterase 4, PDE4. And this medicine called Crisoboral, its brand name is Eucrisa, uh, but the, the medical name is Crisoboral. It really does seem to block this pathway pretty effectively and does so very cleanly, meaning it doesn't seem to have a lot of other side effects, which is really important because if you block the pathway but also cause collateral damage, that's no good. And the other are topical immunosuppressives, Protopic and Eladel, drugs that are praised as non-steroidal, however don't seem to be safe with long-term use. 
I just don't feel comfortable with this because it comes with a black box warning and then they're like, yes, but this is on high, you know, if you're in the sun for a prolonged amount of time and under these conditions and I'm like, I still don't feel comfortable and it's like, uh, whatever. Like you get, literally, it's just like, uh, these mothers. Yeah, you get the same thing, the same reaction to those as you do to steroids when you deny those too. So Both Heather and I use Protopic though, right? A lot. I think that's yeah. what really ruined my skin barrier on my face was the protopic. Like, worse than steroids, I think it was the protopic. I have no barrier on my face. Like, and it's always so my bad. biggest yeah. area of my face, and that's the only place I've ever used a protopic. I really blame that for like everything. I too had used protopic heavily on my face, a sight that still persists with withdrawal symptoms today, because not only does it carry the black box warning but it is metabolized in our system through the CYP3A pathway, which can be an issue for those with a genetic mutation. I have that genetic mutation. If that is not enough, Protopic, medically known as tacrolimus, is not recommended for patients with a barrier dysfunction like generalized erythroderma, a widespread reddening of the skin. So when patients are exhausted by Western medicine, they turn to alternative therapies like Dr. Lee, who carries more than Western treatments in her arsenal. So Western medicine and the traditional Chinese medicine for particular conditions, you can combine them together to help a patient better. There are some pretty significant differences between Dr. Li and the other doctors that I've seen. The main difference is that she really looks at the root of the disease. Ashmi is a three herb. Um, formula, formula. So with Ashmi to summarize the, the f findings is the discovery or results is that can inhibit TH2 but not surprise TH1. So Dr. Lee focuses on the balance between T1 and T2. So T1 and T2 are two main arms of your immune system. T2 is the arm that is supposed to fight parasite infections, but in people with dysfunctional T2 or overactive T2, that T2 arm is being used to fight things like pollen or mold or dust mites. So it's mistaking benign substances as a parasite invasion. Uh, T1, on the other hand, is the side of your immune system that fights bacteria and viruses. So in a patient who is highly allergic, usually their T2 is elevated and their T1 is suppressed. Whereas T1 and T2 need to be in a healthy balance for that individual to be healthy. Dr. Lee's research at Mount Sinai even showcases where topical steroids after long-term use can cause a T2 rise instead of suppressing inflammation. This Chinese herbal uh, compound can inhibit uh, steroids paradoxical adverse effect because you're supposed to, to reduce inflammation. But then after long-term culture, actually, you enhance inflammation. Steroids are very good at suppressing cytokines they're like the soldiers that act out under the T2 general. So once you take the steroids away, those soldiers get released from imprisonment, basically. And then they can carry out the orders of that general that has been strengthened by the steroids, not suppressed. Which helps us further see how damaging long-term use is for our internal system so behind. Dermatology is so behind. Even with other Western tools like phototherapy or vitamin D topical agents, we are still not sure how to help every patient. In the next five years, we should be seeing an increase in systemic treatment, targeting certain ILs and JAK inhibitors, but our road to success is still an arduous one, filled with hurdles and obstacles ahead. So our goal is to promote widespread awareness. And in order to do that, we need more scientific data to prove our case. And one of the ways that we can get that data is to prove prevalence and also the, um, the adverse effects of using topical steroids long term. Prevalence is the ultimate way for our community to make strides towards steroid reform. 
we are ghosts on the dermatology radar, because how do we showcase TSW prevalence with thousands, if not millions, being misdiagnosed? Just because it is compulsory for doctors to place disclaimers before every speech they are paid to give by a pharmaceutical company does not make it ethical. There has to be an end to this conflict of interest if we as patients are expected to blindly trust every doctor we see. Why would any practitioner drowning deep in big pharma pockets concede in stating that topical steroids do in fact come with some major risks if used off-label? Most of us agree that the administrative burden really, it really is a major factor in, in physician burnout and in really damaging that patient-doctor relationship. As patients, we need doctors who aren't burnt out all of the time. It's a domino effect, and if they are under pressure, it rolls into our care. Yet a prudent and responsible FDA change should be to eradicate those few short words from topical steroid labels. Because if doctors are not being held accountable for their actions, a label should not be granting them absolution. And when it comes to children, topical steroids should not only be used with extreme caution, but be much more heavily regulated. Infants and children aren't little adults, and the studies, most of the studies on, you know, topical steroids are based on adults because of ethical reasons for um, randomized controlled trials. But where is the robust studies and the randomized controlled trials that say it's safe to apply a strong potency steroid, like triencinolone, to an infant's face and, and continue to do that? When there is little to no evidence showing the long-term safety of these drugs on children, plus the knowledge of knowing these drugs can in fact cause HBA access suppression, despite that this conversation rarely takes place in a doctor's office, is putting an entire population under unnecessary risk, all the while being able to involve CPS under the guise of child neglect by the parent, not the physician. And then I think that red skin syndrome a group, we want to do a study, not only just to help the treatment, uh, we have uh, several things we want uh, culture. We want to look at the macro uh, biota on the skin, GI, um, the stool samples, and the saliva. So we want to see what the microbiota profiles in this group of patients. We we'll also draw the blood uh, to look at the cytokine profiles. And um, we have uh, other tools, for example, the epigenetics. Perhaps there is a uh, susceptibility more prone to the TH2 allergenic status. Dr. Lee's desire to research what is actually steering our body's dependency on steroids is profound. When it comes to methylation, she would be able to see how steroids play a role in our system, perhaps even finding how certain mutations like the CYP3A gene could be causing our issue. With uh, uh, stronger funding resources, we can get FDA's approval and then more uh, Western medicine uh, practitioners can have uh, tools to help their patients. Dr. Lee is not only working towards having her ASHME protocol be more obtainable for patients, but for it to be added to the list of safer, long-term use medications so that steroid abuse can be an issue of the past. I just got to grips of recognizing who I was in the mirror again, recognizing myself, feeling healthy, feeling bad. And that second flare for me was just so emotionally crushing. I had, I had to work because I'd lost so much money and I was in the office one day and my hair, like the ooze was literally, this was soaking and it was dripping. And I left work one day and I was like, I'm, just, I'm gonna throw myself in front of a tube. I can end this now. I can do this, I can just end this and this pain will be over. And I have never felt that low and even now just thinking about it, it breaks my heart because I, it, that's not me and that's what TSW did to me. And that day was the darkest one for me on record. While in England, I held back tears as each one of these women stepped through the front door. The whole experience, seeing them in person, 
Hearing their harrowing journeys about making it through TSW was exceptionally emotional. I know how it feels when you don't see many people out there. You know, we've got a condition where there's a lot of doubt. You know, the people we're meant to trust are saying, no, it doesn't exist. You've got so many, so many negative things connected to our condition. So to have as much positivity and as many sort of stories of people recovering as possible, I just think it's so vital because I, and I believe in the condition so much. I believe in what I went through. I believe, for me and for thousands of people out there, it is the only alternative. It's mm. horrible and it's it's destructive. You know, it ends your life effectively, but it is also one, the best thing I've ever done. And I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful that I went through it. While in the thick of TSW, it's hard to see how a condition so crushing could also be such a gift. I, I didn't appreciate as I was going through it, the amount of, self-growth and personal development I was actually experiencing just by going to that dark place um, and, and working through it. I mean the list is endless I think probably with most people who recover you do not take your health for granted you you appreciate every little thing your body does whether it is just walking down the street feeling comfortable that is something I don't think will ever get old. I want to live every single minute, every minute of every day. I just want to live, be active, seeing people talking. And one thing that I know is that you can set your mind to anything now. Once you have set your mind and be through that amount of physical pain for that long a time, you can, you can do anything. Even now, there are days I still struggle. I still burn and itch and shed. And I cry over a lost career a lost marriage, a loss of time I will never get back. But I also revel in how wonderful and resilient a person can become when faced with adversity. I don't know, the only thing I would uh, say, I mean, the, the human spirit's pretty amazing. It is so amazing. Because even though I lost my career, I can still cherish the music around me and spring from the gravel below my feet. And even though I lost a partner, it gave me more room to love others who deserve to know how cherished they are. You were all kinds of I found that uh, TSW made me understand the truths of life. I thought... Oh, I, That's good. That's a I, good point. Because I... I really like this point. There is a present in it. There is a gift. I just decided one day, this isn't going to be a negative Thing that happened to me. I've kept this thought in my head since I've gone through withdrawal that pain is a teacher. It's a very hard teacher, but you don't ever forget the lessons you learn from pain. We know our journey isn't over, and we have a long road ahead, but we will never keep quiet. We will shout until the truth is acknowledged so that the next generation will never have to suffer from something that is so preventable.